If you've ever been curious about how Linux stacks up against Windows when it comes to absolute raw performance, or how the new Mac Ultra compares to, let's say, a Threadripper, then today is your lucky day. Because we're going to drag race Windows against Linux using a complete set of performance benchmarks, including running both systems head to head on the bare metal. Then I'll test them each running with WSL2 installed and compare the native performance to the Hyper-V results to see how much, if any, actually gets left on the table that way. We'll even throw the top of the line 20 core Mac Studio Ultra into the mix to see how it compares to the Intel based systems. What is the fastest operating system? And is it faster by 1% or 5% or 20%? I think quite a few people are going to be surprised with the results. So let's get right down to the business and start testing now so we can crown a winner today right here in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And about a year ago, I had what turned out in the long run to be a fairly cool idea. I'd write a prime sieve in C++, Python, and C Sharp, and then see how the relative performance compared between the languages. That was the start of the desktop drag racing project. And thanks to the hard work of folks like Rutger and Tudor and all the other volunteers, the project has grown into a complete set of performance metrics based on the prime sieve in over 80 languages, from Ada to Zig and everything in between. I'll put a link to the Primes project in the video description, as well as links to the most popular drag racing episodes. Benchmarking two computers with a prime sieve is a very specific task, however. It really comes down to how well written the compiler is and the libraries that come with it. As a result, we'd like a more generalized benchmark, and ideally it should be a whole suite of benchmarks. That suite should include a wide range of workloads like compression, web processing, text rendering, physics, image processing, and so on. Such a wide array of tasks will yield a much more level playing field than basing everything off a single problem. The benchmark suite that I ultimately settled on is Geekbench 5, which is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. For hardware, I'm leaning very hard into the multi-core space today. On the PC side, we'll be running a Threadripper 3970 with 64 hyper-threaded cores, and for the Mac numbers, the top-of-the-line Mac Studio Ultra with 20 cores. That gives the PC a core count advantage, of course, so I'll then run the benchmarks on the 5950X, which has just 16 cores, just to see how they stack up. The first thing I'm going to do is run Geekbench on the bare metal of each system, seeing how they perform without any virtualization or hypervisors to get in the way. Let's drop down to the desktop and get started. You can download the free version of the benchmark directly from geekbench.com. For the graphical desktops of Windows, Linux, and the Mac, you simply need to browse to the downloads page and pick the correct system. The download will then automatically start in your browser, and when it's complete, you simply run the installer. Then just start Geekbench 5 like any other application. If you're on a console such as a Linux server, things are a bit more complicated. I used the text mode browser links to download a copy just to prove it's possible to do it in a browser without a mouse and a GUI, but you should really just use wget and grab it on the command line like this. As you can see, the file actually has two extensions. It's a gzip compressed tar archive, so the first thing we have to do is to decompress it with gunzip. Next, we use tar with the xvf command to extract the contents of the tar archive into a new folder. When that's complete, Drop into that new folder, called something like Geekbench-Linux with a version number in the middle, and in that folder, you'll find an executable program called Geekbench 5, and you run that to launch the benchmark session. From there, the run is fully automated and it will run to completion on its own. Our first runs will be Geekbench under Ubuntu on the 5950X. Then I'll repeat the runs on the 3970X to gather those numbers as well. First, I'll run it under WSL, which enables me to use screen capture software so you can see what I'm doing. That no doubt impacts the performance a little bit, but it was equally true for all contenders except the bare metal runs, where I did not use a screen recorder to ensure the results that I achieved were the highest possible score. So I recorded that run with my phone, and we'll do that next. For now though, let's continue under WSL2. This machine has 16 hyper-threaded CPU cores for a total of 32 threads, which are accompanied by 32 gigabytes of memory. The first thing that Geekbench does is run each of its subtests in single core mode. This is where only one CPU core is employed to do a single copy of a single task at a time, as fast as possible. It measures the absolute max single core performance of your machine. To gather this score, it runs an impressive list of benchmarks. It starts with AES encryption, and then text compression, and then image compression, web navigation, HTML5 rendering, SQL database processing, PDF rendering, 
plain text rendering, the C compiler, camera processing, and then some physics simulations. But wait, there's more, because it next does blurs, face detection, horizon detection, image inpainting, HDR image processing, ray tracing, structure for motion, speech recognition, and then finally some machine learning for good measure. As you can see then, it's a very thorough test, especially compared to running a single problem like a prime sieve on a piece of hardware to measure the perf. As soon as it's done the single threaded tests, it repeats the entire set, but this time on all cores at once. If the single core results tell you how quickly the CPU could return the first results of a set, the multi-core score really tells you how much work the CPU could get done in the allotted time. It's a little like the old horsepower versus torque debate. Horsepower sells computers, but torque wins races, so. As soon as these multi-core tests are complete, Geekbench then does not give you the results directly. Instead, it uploads them to the Geekbench results database and you are given a URL with which you can view them in a browser. If you have a Geekbench account set up, which I suggest you do, you can also sign those results into your account for safekeeping with the second URL that you're given. Either way, that's when and where you get the results, on their webpage. To do the bare metal testing, I opted to go with Linux server rather than a desktop distribution, figuring that's where I would get the lowest overhead and highest results. And so, I installed it raw on both the 5950X and the 3970X. On the 3970X it was installed on a dedicated spare Optane 905P, and on the 5950X it was installed on a 980 Pro from Samsung. Both are pretty fast drives. Once the install was complete, I removed the boot media and then rebooted the system to bring up Linux for the first time on the machines. I had to swap which of the two Ethernet ports on the back of the machine was being used as it blocked at the network startup until I did so. A Linux install is pretty seamless these days, but you can still run into issues like that that Windows setup would probably get past. I'm guessing it was network adapter 1 instead of 0, and so it was waiting for 0 to be active, but I don't really know. I was a little surprised. But as soon as the machine came up, I supplied my new username and got a password in and before running sudo apt update and then sudo apt upgrade to bring the machine all the way up to date. Next I used wget to retrieve the file from Geekbench, gnzip to decompress it and then tar to extract the contents to a new folder. After I cd'd into that folder I then ran the Geekbench 5 application directly. Just like the WSL case, we can let it run on its own and it walks through all of the test cases. We can see the machine is properly identified as having 32 cores, 64 threads, and 126 gigabytes of memory. I'm not really sure where the other 2 gigabytes go, they must be reserved for Linux itself, which is a bit weird because you'd figure that 640k should be enough for anybody. Once it runs through both the single and multi-core scenarios, I use the Lynx browser to launch the URL, whereupon I can actually scroll up and down and review the scores for each individual test if I want to. For now, I'll just write down the overall single core and multi-core results. Next, we can do this under Windows, where the procedure is much the same. Under Windows, we are presented with a simple GUI that we can use to control and launch the benchmarks, and just as we did with the console version, we let it run to completion and then visit the URL that it kicks out at the end in order to get the full results. Next, I want to repeat the Linux tests from within a Docker container. There's a GitHub project with a Docker container already set up and ready to run Geekbench, and I'll put a link to that in the video description as well for your convenience. Assuming you have Docker installed, you can launch the Geekbench suite easily with the Docker run command and the image name. Running the benchmark under Docker looks pretty much identical to running it from the Linux command line, with the exception that under memory information, we can see that the Docker container is only granted access to 32 gigabytes of memory while the machine itself has 128. After I completed this suite of tests on the one CPU, I then ran the same suite on each of the others so that I had results for the Ryzen 5950X, the Threadripper 3970X, the MacBook Pro Max, the Mac Studio Ultra, and the old smelly Dell that runs Ubuntu off in the corner of my office where it weekly generates prime number racing results all day long. I figured it would be interesting to compare the old Core 2 Duo to the latest CPUs. And with that, we can finally turn to some charts and graphs. Rather than hold out on you to the end, I'll start with the big picture. Windows versus Linux, raw on the bare metal. This graph compares the performance of Windows and Linux running on the same hardware. Not at the same time, of course. Each was booted from its own dedicated drive, and there was no virtualization or hypervisor involved. As you can see, Linux comes in at 1370 and Windows is right behind it at 1348, which is a little over 98% of the performance of Linux. I'm actually quite surprised that the result is that close when the software benchmark is as complete as Geekbench seems to be. I actually wasn't sure who was going to win, but I was reasonably confident that the gap would be much wider than 1 or 2%. I think that bodes well for us as users, though, as it indicates that both are approaching the performance limits of what is actually possible. 
It's likely worth noting that while Linux eked out a win here, it, it was on a server edition running a pure console with no desktop, no mouse pointer, and so on. Windows, on the other hand, was logged into a user desktop session. That means Geekbench was running in a window, which was on a desktop, which was part of a window station, and so on. I don't think that should have had a material effect on the benchmark results. I'm just noting it for completeness. Next, let's take a look at the difference between running on the bare metal versus running under the WSL2 hypervisor, and then we'll compare both of those scenarios with running in a Docker container. This graph illustrates the results. Linux bare metal at 1370, Windows at 1348, and WSL2 at 1311. Now, the fact that WSL2 turns in 96% of the performance of a bare metal Linux installation is a pretty compelling reason to run it that way, I think. But if you're really in a scenario where 4% makes all the difference, now you know. Docker, on the other hand, does impose a significant hit of about 15% in my own testing. The processor information displayed during the Geekbench run showed that Docker was getting access to all of the CPU cores, but only 32 gigabytes of the memory, while the native numbers were run with 128 gigabytes. I tried specifying more, but the Docker container seemed to max out at 32. With Docker, of course, the environment is fully virtualized, so some overhead is to be expected. Running software as a container, though, can be hugely convenient, so even though it sounds like 15% is a lot, it might just be worth it in many cases. When it came time for the multi-threaded testing, Linux again scored a win with Windows trailing at 95% of the speed. Linux running under WSL comes in right behind that at 92%. One thing I don't know enough about myself to really speak to it well is how the CPU is scheduled by the hypervisor. Is the Linux WSL multi-threaded case hobbled in some way by the Windows scheduler, or is it of no consequence to the Linux side? And if it isn't, what arbitration scheme is actually used to allocate CPU time slices amongst the hypervisor clients? If you know the answer, let me know in the comments. With Linux in a Docker container, we see about the same performance impact in the multi-threaded case as we did in the single-threaded container. It produces 86% of the performance of the Linux bare metal case. That said, however, it's important to note that this was Docker for Windows running an Ubuntu container, which probably uses WSL, and so that 86% number should really be viewed in light of the WSL numbers and not the raw hardware numbers. In other words, it was running at about 92% of the performance of the environment in which it was operating. Let's write out the picture now by including the Mac in the mix. Geekbench runs natively on the ARM Macs now, so it's a perfect opportunity to compare Mac versus Windows versus Linux reasonably fairly. The first chart illustrates the single core results. It includes three different Macs ranging from the entry level Mac Mini to the top of the line Mac Studio Ultra. As expected though, the M1 performance for single core workloads is fairly consistent across the CPUs with a best of 1777. The next higher score was turned in on the 5950X by Linux under WSL at 1780, and then by Linux on the bare metal at 1781. Notice how close those numbers are. It means for some reason that Windows WSL was able to turn in 99.94% of the performance of the bare metal. I'm not entirely sure why, but I tried it a couple times. This wasn't the case on the Threadripper, just the 5950X. And when you're running on the 5950X, it seemed to really not matter whether you were under WSL or not. This final chart is, I think, the most interesting and revealing of them all. It focuses on the multi-core results, and the placement of the various Macs tells us a great deal. The M1 Max turns in a multi-threaded benchmark at 12649, that is about 85% of the overall score of the Ryzen 5950X. The 20-core Mac Ultra is a solid 50% faster than the Ryzen chip. The 3970 Threadripper turns in a best of 29,034, which is 25% faster than the Mac Ultra. We've already covered all the relative scores of Linux and Windows in each of these cases, and so, with the Mac numbers in context, we can move on to declare a winner. Like a real drag race, sometimes the results are determined by hundreds or thousands of a second. And so, regardless of how close it is, I too have to pick a winner, and today's winner is Linux. In summary, on the 3970X, Linux bests Windows by about 5% in the single and multi-threaded workloads, but on the 5950X, that margin drops to about 2% on single-threaded workloads. There certainly are environments and problems where 2% is a material difference. But whether it's worth whatever trade-offs you have to make to get that 2% is another question, and one that only you can answer. I'd love to hear your thoughts about these results. I'll be watching the comments for clever insights, so don't leave me hanging. If along the way you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving me a like and subscribing to the channel. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then.
Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please do be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And in the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.